Surgical Therapy Surgery is the oldest form of cancer treatment. The treatment of choice for many years was to remove the cancer and as much of the surrounding normal tissue as possible. What this approach did not fully consider was the ability of cancer cells to travel from the original tumor site to other locations, making surgical cure possible only when the tumor was localized and relatively small. Today, surgery is used to meet a variety of goals, figure 15.9. The trend is toward less radical surgeries. Prevention. Surgical intervention can be used to eliminate or reduce the risk for cancer development. Prophylactic removal of non-vital organs has been successful in reducing the risk for some cancers. For example, patients who have adenomatous familial polyposis may benefit from a total colostomy to prevent colorectal cancer. See Chapter 42. Those who have genetic mutations of BRCA1 or BRCA2 and have a strong family history of early onset breast cancer may consider having a prophylactic mastectomy. See Chapter 51. Cure or Control When the goal is cure or control, the objective is to remove all or as much resectable tumor as possible while sparing normal tissue. Examples of surgical procedures used for cure or control of cancer include radical neck dissection, mastectomy, thyroidectomy, nephrectomy, hysterectomy, and or oophorectomy. Definition for oophorectomy is the removal of one or both ovaries. A debulking or cytoreductive procedure may be used if the tumor cannot be completely removed, e.g. a tumor attached to a vital organ. When this occurs, as much tumor as possible is removed, and the patient is given chemotherapy and or radiation therapy. This type of surgical procedure can make chemotherapy or radiation therapy more effective since the tumor mass is reduced before treatment is started. Other times, a patient may need to receive neoadjuvant treatment before surgery, chemotherapy, and or radiation therapy to reduce tumor size and improve the surgical outcome. Supportive and palliative care. When cure or control of cancer is no longer possible, the focus shifts to supportive care and palliation of symptoms. Surgical procedures may be used to provide supportive care that maximizes bodily function or facilitates cancer treatment. Examples of supportive surgical procedures include insertion of a feeding tube to maintain nutrition during head and neck cancer treatment, placement of a central venous axis device to deliver chemotherapy agents, prophylactic surgical fixation of bones at risk for pathologic fracture. Effects of treatment or symptoms from metastatic cancer may require surgical interventions for palliation. Examples include 1. Tumor debulking to relieve pain or pressure. 2. Colostomy for the relief of a bowel obstruction. See Chapter 42. And 3. Laminectomy for the relief of a spinal cord compression. See Chapter 60. Chemotherapy. Chemotherapy, anti-neoplastic therapy, is the use of chemicals as a systemic therapy for cancer. In the 1970s, chemotherapy was proven an effective treatment for cancer. Chemotherapy is now a mainstay of cancer treatment for most solid tumors and hematologic cancers, e.g. leukemias, lymphomas. Chemotherapy can offer cure for some cancers, control other cancers for long periods, and in some cases, offer palliative relief of symptoms when cure or control is no longer possible. Figure 15.10. Effect on cells. The goal of chemotherapy is to eliminate or reduce the number of cancer cells in the primary and metastatic tumor sites. All cells, cancer cells and normal cells, enter the cell cycle for replication and proliferation. Figure 15.1. The effects of the chemotherapy drugs are described in relation to the cell cycle. 
The two major categories of chemotherapy drugs are cell cycle phase nonspecific and cell cycle phase specific drugs. Cell cycle phase nonspecific chemotherapy drugs have their effect on the cells during all phases of the cell cycle. This includes the process of cell replication and proliferation and the resting phase, G0. Cell cycle phase specific chemotherapy drugs have their greatest effects during specific phases of the cell cycle, e.g. when cells are in the process of replication or proliferation during G1, S, G2, or M. Cell cycle phase specific and cell cycle phase nonspecific agents are often given together to maximize effectiveness by using agents that function in different ways and throughout the cell cycle. When cancer first begins to develop, most of the cells are actively dividing. As the tumor increases in size, more cells become inactive and convert to a resting state, G0. Because most chemotherapy agents are effective against dividing cells, cells can escape death by staying in the G0 phase. A major challenge is to overcome the effect of resistant resting and non-cycling cells. Classification of chemotherapy drugs. Chemotherapy drugs are classified in general groups according to their molecular structure and mechanisms of action. Table 15.7. Each drug in a particular class has many similarities. However, there are major differences in how the drugs work and the unique side effects associated with drugs in each class. Preparation of chemotherapy. Only persons specifically trained in chemotherapy handling techniques should be involved with the preparation and administration of cancer drugs. They may pose an occupational hazard to healthcare professionals who do not follow safe handling guidelines. A person preparing, transporting, or giving chemotherapy may absorb the drug through inhalation of particles when reconstituting a powder or through skin contact from exposure to droplets or powder. There may be some risk in handling the body fluids and excretions of people during the first 48 hours after they receive chemotherapy. Guidelines for the safe handling of chemotherapy agents have been developed by the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, OSHA, and Oncology Nursing Society, ONS. Methods of administration. Chemotherapy can be given by multiple routes, Table 15.8. With advances in drug formulation techniques, more oral chemotherapy agents are available. With oral agents, the patient will need to be taught about storage and side effects. The IV route is the most common method of giving chemotherapy. Major concerns associated with IV chemotherapy administration include venous access problems, device or catheter related infection, and extravasation. It is the infiltration of drugs into tissues surrounding the infusion site causing local tissue damage, figure 15.11. Many chemotherapy drugs are either irritants or vesicants. Irritants will damage the intima of the vein, causing phlebitis and sclerosis and limiting future peripheral venous access. They will not cause tissue damage if infiltrated. However, vesicants, if inadvertently infiltrated into the skin, may cause severe local tissue breakdown and necrosis. It is extremely important to monitor for and promptly take action if extravasation of a vesicant occurs. To minimize discomfort, emotional distress, and risks of infection and infiltration, IV chemotherapy can be given through a central venous access device, CVAD. CVADs are placed in large blood vessels and allow frequent, continuous, or intermittent administration of chemotherapy, immunotherapy, and targeted therapy, and other products, thus avoiding multiple venipunctures for vascular access. CVADs are discussed in Chapter 16. Regional Chemotherapy Administration Regional treatment with chemotherapy involves delivery of the drug directly to the tumor site. 
The advantage of this method is that higher concentrations of the drug can be delivered to the tumor with less systemic toxicity. Several regional delivery methods have been developed. These include intra-arterial, intra-peritoneal, intra-thecal, intra-ventricular, and intra-vesical bladder chemotherapy. Intra-arterial chemotherapy. Intra-arterial chemotherapy delivers the drug to the tumor through the arteries, supplying the tumor. This method has been used for the treatment of osteogenic sarcoma, cancers of the head and neck, bladder and cervix, melanoma, primary liver cancer, and metastatic liver disease. One method of intra-arterial drug delivery involves the surgical placement of a catheter that is connected to an external or implanted infusion pump for infusion of the chemotherapy agent. Intraperitoneal chemotherapy involves the delivery of chemotherapy to the peritoneal cavity. It is a treatment for peritoneal metastases from primary colorectal and ovarian cancers and malignant ascites. Temporary silastic catheters, Tenkoff, Hickman, or Groshong, are percutaneously or surgically placed into the peritoneal cavity for short-term administration of chemotherapy. An implanted port also can be used to give chemotherapy intraperitoneally. Chemotherapy is generally infused into the peritoneum in one to two liters of fluid and allowed to dwell in the peritoneum for one to four hours. After the dwell time, the fluid is drained from the peritoneum. Intrathecal or intraventricular chemotherapy. Cancers that metastasize to the central nervous system, CNS, are hard to treat because the blood-brain barrier often prevents distribution of chemotherapy to this area. One method used to treat metastasis to the CNS is intrathecal chemotherapy. This method involves a lumbar puncture and injection of chemotherapy into the subarachnoid space. To reduce the need for repeated lumbar punctures, patients may have an OMIA reservoir inserted. An OMIA reservoir is a silastic dome-shaped disc with an extension catheter that is surgically implanted through the cranium into a lateral ventricle. Intravesical bladder chemotherapy. Intravesical bladder chemotherapy involves instilling chemotherapy into the bladder. This is done through a urinary catheter. The solution is retained for one to three hours. Effects of chemotherapy on normal tissues. Chemotherapy agents cannot selectively distinguish between normal cells and cancer cells. Chemotherapy-induced side effects are the result of the destruction of normal cells, especially those that are rapidly proliferating. These include those in the bone marrow, lining of the GI system, and integument, skin, hair, nails. Table 15.9. The general and drug-specific adverse effects of these drugs are classified as acute, delayed, or chronic. Acute toxicity occurs during and right after drug administration. It includes anaphylactic and hypersensitivity reactions, extravasation or a flare reaction, anticipatory nausea and vomiting, and dysrhythmias. Delayed effects are numerous. They include delayed nausea and vomiting, mucositis, alopecia, skin rashes, bone marrow suppression, altered bowel function, diarrhea, constipation, and a variety of cumulative neurotoxicities. Definition of the term mucositis is the painful inflammation and ulceration of the mucous membranes lining the digestive tract. Definition of alopecia is simply hair loss or baldness. Chronic toxicities involve damage to organs such as the heart, liver, kidneys, and lungs. Chronic toxicities involve damage to organs such as the heart, liver, kidneys, and lungs. Chronic toxicities can be either long-term effects that develop during or right after treatment and persist or late effects that are absent during treatment and manifest later. Some side effects fall into more than one category. For example, nausea and vomiting can be both acute and delayed. Treatment plan. 
Although single drug chemotherapy is sometimes prescribed, the most common modality is combining agents in multidrug regimens. Multidrug treatment targets more than one signaling pathway and is more effective in managing most cancers. The regimens involve drugs with different mechanisms of action and varying toxicity profiles. However, when chemotherapy agents are used in combination, patients can have an increase in toxicities. Drug regimens are chosen based on evidence supporting their use in specific cancers. Sometimes they are customized to meet the needs of an individual patient. Chemotherapy is most effective when the tumor burden is low. Therapy is not interrupted and the patient receives the intended dose. The dose of each drug is based on the person's body weight and height using the body surface area calculation. Mutation of cancer cells within the tumor can result in cells that are resistant to chemotherapy. With multiple drugs working at different places in the cell cycle, cancer cells can be more effectively killed. Thus, mutation and resistance of cancer cells can be decreased. Radiation therapy. Along with surgery, radiation therapy is one of the oldest methods of cancer treatment. It was first used to treat a woman with breast cancer in 1896. Although the patient responded locally, she died later of metastatic disease. It was not until the 1960s that advances in equipment and treatment planning facilitated the delivery of adequate radiation doses to tumors and tolerable doses to normal tissues. Today, many cancer patients receive radiation therapy at some point in their treatment. Effects of radiation. Radiation is energy that is emitted from a source and travels through space or some material. Delivery of high energy beams, when absorbed into tissue, produces ionization of atomic particles. The energy in ionizing radiation acts to break the chemical bonds in DNA. The DNA is damaged, causing cell death. Different types of ionizing radiation are used to treat cancer, including electromagnetic radiation, e.g. x-rays, gamma rays, and particulate radiation, e.g. alpha particles, electrons, neutrons, protons. High energy x-rays, photons, are generated by an electric machine, such as a linear accelerator. Technologic advances have expanded and refined the sources and methods of delivering radiation therapy. This allows for more accurate and less invasive treatment options. Most radiation centers in the United States use megavoltage linear accelerator technology. Larger facilities may offer a combination of machines that give patients more options at that site. Principles of radiobiology. As a radiation beam passes through the treatment field, energy is deposited. Low energy beams, e.g. electrons, expend energy quickly on impact with matter, so they penetrate only a short distance. They are clinically useful in treating superficial skin lesions. High energy beams, e.g. photons, have greater depth of penetration, not reaching full intensity until they reach a certain depth. This makes them suitable for delivering optimal doses to internal targets while sparing the skin. Technically, all cancer cells could be killed with radiation given in high enough doses. However, to avoid serious toxicity and long-term complications of treatment, radiation to surrounding healthy tissue must be limited to the maximal tolerated dose for that specific tissue. Advances in planning and in delivery technology, e.g. intensity modulated radiation therapy, IMRT, and image-guided radiation therapy, IGRT, have greatly improved the ability to deliver maximal doses while sparing critical structures, e.g. spinal cord, carotid arteries, optic chiasm, as much as possible. Historically, the radiation dose was expressed in units called RADS, radiation-absorbed doses. Now we use gray, GY, or centigray, CGY, a centigray is equal to one rad. One centigray equals one gray. Once the total dose to be delivered is determined, that dose is divided into daily fractions. Doses between 180 and 200 
centigrade per day are considered standard fractionation. They are typically delivered once a day, Monday through Friday, for a period of two to eight weeks, depending on the desired total dose. Certain cancers are more responsive to the effects of radiation than others. Table 15.10. Radiosensitivity is the relative responsiveness of cells and tissues to the effects of radiation. In highly responsive tumors, such as lymphomas, even a large tumor is affected by radiation therapy. In less responsive tumors, there may be a slower or incomplete response. Localized prostate cancer responds very slowly to radiation, several months after treatment is completed. Simulation and treatment planning. Simulation is a process by which the radiation treatment fields are defined, filmed, and marked out on the skin. The radiation oncologist specifies the dose and volume of the area to be treated. Treatment volumes include the one gross target volume, GTV, which is the gross extent of the tumor identified by examination or imaging, two, the clinical target volume, CTV, which is the GTV plus additional margin to encompass any potential microscopic or subclinical disease, and three, the planning target volume, PTV, which is the GTV slash CTV plus additional margin to allow for organ motion or variance in daily setup position. During the simulation, the patient is positioned on a simulator. It is a diagnostic x-ray machine that recreates the actions of the linear accelerator. The radiation fields are marked on the patient's skin. Immobilization devices, e.g. casts, bite blocks, thermoplastic face masks, are typically used to help the patient keep a stable position. Figure 15.12. The target is defined using a variety of imaging techniques, e.g. x-rays, CT, MRI, PET scans, physical examination, and surgical reports. Small tattoos may be placed to ensure the patient position is precisely reproduced each treatment. Treatment. Radiation is used to treat a carefully defined area of the body. Since radiation affects only tissues within the treatment field, it is not appropriate as the main treatment for systemic disease. However, radiation may be used by itself in combination with chemotherapy or surgery to treat primary tumors or for palliation of metastatic lesions. External radiation. Radiation can be delivered externally, external beam radiation therapy, or internally, brachytherapy. External beam radiation is the most common form of radiation treatment delivery. With this technique, the patient is exposed to radiation from a megavoltage treatment machine. The beam passes through the external tissues to reach the internal target. A linear accelerator, which generates ionizing radiation from electricity and can have multiple energies, is the most commonly used machine for delivering external beam radiation, figure 15.13. Gamma knife technology used to deliver highly accurate stereotactic treatment to a localized treatment volume uses a cobalt source. Internal radiation. Radiation can be delivered as brachytherapy, which means close, or internal radiation treatment. It consists of the implantation or insertion of radioactive materials directly into the tumor, interstitial, or near the tumor, intracavitary or intraluminal. This allows for direct delivery of radiation to the target with minimal exposure to surrounding healthy tissues. It is often used in combination with external radiation as a supplemental boost treatment. It may be a primary or adjuvant therapy. Sources of radiation for brachytherapy include temporary sealed sources, e.g. iridium-192, cesium-137, and permanent sealed sources, e.g. iodine-125, gold-198, palladium-103. These are supplied in the form of seeds or ribbons. With a temporary implant, the source may be placed into a special catheter or metal tube that has been inserted into the tumor area. It is left in place until the prescribed dose of radiation has been reached in the calculated number of hours. Brachytherapy may be delivered as high-dose rate, HDR, treatment, 
e.g. several doses given at varying intervals over a few minutes each time, or low-dose rate LDR treatment, e.g. continuous treatment over several hours or days. A remote afterloading technique, e.g. the source is inserted after the applicator is in place, is designed to enhance HCP and patient safety. It is used for HDR brachytherapy with Iridium-192. These methods are often used for head and neck, long breast, and gynecologic cancers. Permanent implants, such as for prostate brachytherapy, involve the insertion of radioactive seeds directly into the tumor tissue where they stay permanently. As interstitial seeds used for treatment emit low energies with limited tissue penetration, patients are not considered radioactive. However, some initial radiation precautions may be recommended because of a small risk of seed dislodgement. Over time, the isotopes that are used decay and are no longer radioactive. The time frame for side effects induced by treatment can be predicted based on the rate of decay for the specific isotope used. Radioactive drugs or radiopharmaceuticals are used to treat some cancers systemically. They may be given orally as a capsule or drink, e.g. iodine-131 for thyroid cancer or IV as with Yttrium-90, given for resistant lymphomas, or Samarium-153, used to treat bone metastases. The drug is sometimes bound to monoclonal antibodies. The antibodies attach to the cancer cell, directly delivering the radiation. This may minimize the effects of the radiation on healthy cells. Caring for the person undergoing brachytherapy or receiving radioactive drugs requires that you be aware when the patient is emitting radioactivity. Patients with temporary implants are radioactive only while the source is in place. In those with permanent implants, because these sources have short half-lives and are weak emitters, the radioactive exposure to the outside and to others is low. These patients may be discharged with minimal precautions. The principles of ALARA, as low as reasonably achievable, and time, distance, and shielding are vital to our safety when caring for the person with a source of internal radiation. Organize care to limit the time spent in direct contact with the patient. To minimize anxiety and confusion, tell the patient the reason for time and distance limitations before the procedure. The radiation safety officer will say how much time at a specific distance can be spent with the patient. This is determined by the dose delivered by the implant. Because the source is non-penetrating, small differences in distance are critical. Only care that must be delivered near the source, such as checking placement of the implant, is done in close proximity. Use shielding if available. Do not deliver care without wearing a film badge dosimeter, showing cumulative radiation exposure. Do not share the film badge. Do not wear it anywhere but at work and return it according to the agency's protocol. Nursing management, chemotherapy, and radiation therapy. You play a key role in helping patients deal with the side effects of chemotherapy and radiation therapy. Before starting teaching, assess the patient's ability to process information. Customize teaching to meet the patient's and caregiver's learning needs. Common side effects of chemotherapy and radiation are outlined in Table 15.11. Bone marrow suppression, fatigue, GI disturbances, skin and mucosal reactions, and pulmonary and reproductive effects are discussed in this section. Nursing Implementation Bone Marrow Suppression Myelosuppression is one of the most common effects of chemotherapy. To a lesser extent, it can occur with radiation. Treatment-induced myelosuppression can result in life-threatening and distressing effects. These include infection, hemorrhage, and overwhelming fatigue. The major difference in manifestations between radiation therapy and chemotherapy is that radiation, a local therapy, only affects bone marrow within the treatment field. Chemotherapy, a systemic therapy, affects bone marrow function throughout the body. When the therapies are combined, the risk for myelosuppression greatly increases. In general, the onset of bone marrow suppression is related to the lifespan of the type of blood cell. WBCs, especially neutrophils, are affected first within one to two weeks. Platelets in two to three weeks and red blood cells, RBCs, with a longer lifespan of 120 days later. The severity of myelosuppression depends on the chemotherapy drugs used, drug dosages, and the radiation treatment field. Radiation to large marrow-containing regions of the body 
produces the most clinically significant myelosuppression. In the adult, most of the active bone marrow is in the pelvis and thoracic and lumbar vertebrae. Monitor the CBC, especially the neutrophil, platelet, and RBC counts in patients receiving chemotherapy or radiation. Patients often have the lowest blood cell counts, called the nadir, between 7 and 10 days after starting therapy. However, the exact onset depends on the drug regimen. Neutropenia is more common in patients receiving chemotherapy than radiation therapy. It is a serious risk factor for life-threatening infection and sepsis. Significant neutropenia will prompt treatment delay or adjustments, e.g. lower dosages. Take every measure to prevent infections in these patients. Hand hygiene is the mainstay of patient protection. Patients and their contacts, including healthcare team members, should follow hand washing guidelines. Monitor temperature routinely. Any sign of infection should be treated promptly since fever in the presence of neutropenia is a medical emergency. WBC growth factors, e.g. filgrastum, neupogen, pegfilgrastum, nulasta, are routinely used to reduce the duration of chemotherapy-induced neutropenia. They are used as a prophylactic measure to prevent neutropenia when highly myelosuppressive chemotherapy drugs are used. Neutropenia is discussed in Chapter 30. See the Patient Teaching Guide in Table 30.23 and E-Nursing Care Plan 30.3 on the website for this chapter. Thrombocytopenia can result in spontaneous bleeding or major hemorrhage. Avoid invasive procedures. Teach patients to avoid activities that place them at risk for injury or bleeding, including excessive straining. Risk for serious bleeding is generally not present until the platelet count falls below 50,000 per microliter. Platelet transfusions can be necessary and are usually given when platelet counts fall below 20,000 per microliter. Thrombocytopenia is discussed in Chapter 30. See the Patient Teaching Guide in Table 30.15 and E-Nursing Care Plan 30.2 on the website for that chapter. Anemia is common in patients undergoing either radiation therapy or chemotherapy. It generally has a later onset, about three to four months after starting treatment. For patients with low hemoglobin levels, RBC growth factors, e.g. darbopoietin, RNSP, epoietin, procrit, may be given according to clinical guidelines. In extreme circumstances, e.g. symptomatic anemia, RBC transfusions may be needed. However, in general, RBC transfusions are avoided. Hemopoietic growth factors are discussed later in this chapter and in Table 15.15. That's some exciting material right there. Fatigue. Fatigue is the persistent subjective sense of tiredness that interferes with usual day-to-day -day functioning. Fatigue is a nearly universal symptom affecting most patients with cancer. It is often reported by patients as the most distressful of treatment-related side effects. Fatigue may persist long after treatment has ended. Anemia is one cause of fatigue. Other causes may be related to the one accumulation of toxic substances that are left in the body after cells are killed by cancer treatment, two, need for extra energy to repair and heal body tissue damaged by treatment, and three, lack of sleep caused by some chemotherapy drugs. Assess for reversible causes of fatigue, such as anemia, hypothyroidism, depression, anxiety, insomnia, dehydration, or infection. Help patients recognize that fatigue is a common side effect of therapy. Teach them energy conservation strategies. Help patients identify days or times during the day when they typically feel better. Encourage them to be more active during that period. Resting before activity and having others help with work or home tasks may be necessary. Ignoring the fatigue or overstressing the body when fatigue is tolerable may lead to an increase in symptoms. Maintaining exercise and activity within tolerable limits is often helpful to managing fatigue. Walking programs are a way for most patients to keep active without overtaxing themselves. Staying active helps improve mood and avoid the debilitating cycle of fatigue, depression, fatigue that can occur in patients with cancer. Guidelines for the evaluation and management of cancer-related fatigue are available. Gastrointestinal effects. The cells of the mucosal lining of the GI tract are highly proliferative. 
The epithelial cells are replaced every two to six days. The intestinal mucosa is one of the most sensitive tissues to radiation and chemotherapy. The cause of GI reactions is related to a variety of mechanisms. These include, one, the release of serotonin from the GI tract, which then stimulates the chemoreceptor trigger zone, CTZ, and the vomiting center in the brain, and two, cell death and resulting damage to GI mucosa. Radiation to treatment fields that contain GI structures, e.g. abdominopelvic, lumbosacral, lower thoracic areas, and selected chemotherapy agents cause direct injury to GI epithelial cells. These injuries cause a variety of GI effects, including nausea and vomiting, diarrhea, mucositis, and anorexia. These problems can significantly affect the patient's hydration and nutritional status and sense of well-being. Nausea and vomiting. Nausea and vomiting are common effects of chemotherapy and sometimes radiation therapy. Chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting, CIMV, may occur within one hour of chemotherapy administration. Vomiting may start a few hours after radiation therapy to the chest or abdomen. It may persist for 24 hours or more. Several antiemetic drugs are available. See Table 41.1. Serotonin, 5-HT3 receptor antagonists, ondansetron, zofran, granisetron, palinocetron, aloxy, and neurokinin-1 receptor antagonists, NK1RA, e.g. aprepitant, emend, natupitant, rolapitant, viruby, can reduce CINV. Dexamethasone is given with other antiemetics to manage acute and delayed CINV. Akinzeo is a fixed combination of palinocetron, a 5-HT3 receptor antagonist, and natupitant, a NK1RA antagonist. Good Lord. Anticipatory nausea and vomiting can develop if a patient has poorly controlled nausea and vomiting after chemotherapy administration. In this phenomenon, encountering the cues even without receiving treatment may precipitate nausea and vomiting. Aggressive emesis control, including giving prophylactic antiemetic and anti-anxiety medication one hour before treatment is recommended. The patient may find that eating a light meal of non-irritating food before treatment is helpful. Delayed nausea and vomiting can develop 24 hours to a week after treatment. Assess patients who have nausea and vomiting for signs and symptoms of dehydration and metabolic alkalosis. Nausea and vomiting can be successfully managed with antiemetic drugs, diet adjustments, and other non-drug interventions, e.g. relaxation breathing. Diarrhea. Diarrhea is the reaction of the bowel mucosa to radiation and some chemotherapy drugs. It is characterized by an increase in frequency and liquidity of stool. Small bowel is extremely sensitive and does not tolerate significant radiation doses. With pelvic radiation, patients may be treated with a full bladder, this moves a small bowel out of the treatment field. Both radiation and chemotherapy-induced diarrhea are best managed with diet adjustments, anti-diarrheals, anti-motility agents, and anti-spasmodics. See Table 42.2. Recommended diet low in fiber and residue before chemotherapy known to cause diarrhea. This includes limiting foods high in roughage, e.g. fresh fruits, vegetables, seeds, and nuts. To prevent diarrhea, other foods to avoid include fried, fatty, or highly seasoned foods and foods that are gas producing. Bowel mucosal injury from radiation may cause temporary lactose intolerance, so avoiding milk products is helpful for some patients during and right after treatment. Depending on the severity of the diarrhea, hydration and electrolyte supplementation are recommended. Lukewarm sitz baths may ease discomfort and cleanse the rectal area if significant rectal irritation has developed. The rectal area must be kept clean and dry to maintain skin integrity. Inspect the perianal area for evidence of skin breakdown. Systemic analgesia may be used for painful skin irritations. 
Note the number, volume, consistency, and character of stools per day. Have patients keep a diary or log to record episodes and aggravating and alleviating factors. Mucositis. Mucositis is irritation, inflammation, and or ulceration of the mucosa. Chemotherapy or radiation therapy can cause mucositis. Patients diagnosed with head and neck cancer who receive radiation are at high risk. Like the bowel mucosa, the mucosal linings of the oral cavity, oropharynx, and esophagus are extremely sensitive to the effects of radiation and chemotherapy. Certain factors can compound the problem. For example, patients undergoing head and neck radiation may face the added challenge of radiation-induced parotid gland dysfunction. This may result in decreased salivary flow, causing acute or chronic xerostomia, dry mouth. Dryness or thick saliva comprises the protective salivary functions of assisting with cleansing teeth, moistening food, and swallowing. Meticulous oral care during and for a long time after treatment reduces the risk which may occur due to decreased saliva. Teach patients to continue regular dental follow-up every six months. They should use fluoride supplements as recommended by their dentist. Saliva substitutes may be offered to patients with xerostomia. Many patients find that drinking small amounts of water frequently has a similar effect. Dyskusia, taste loss, may develop during therapy. By the end of treatment, patients often report that all food has lost its flavor. Ultimately, nutritional status may be compromised. Dysphagia, difficulty swallowing, which marks pharyngeal and or esophageal involvement, further impedes eating. Patients may report feeling that they have a lump as they swallow and that foods get stuck. The patient with odinophagia, painful swallowing, caused by oropharyngeal or esophageal irritation and ulceration, may need analgesics before meals. Oral assessment and meticulous intervention to keep the oral cavity moist, clean, and free of debris are essential to prevent infection and promote nutritional intake. Implementing standard oral care protocols that address prevention and management of mucositis promotes routine assessment, patient and caregiver teaching, and intervention. Routinely assess the oral cavity mucous membranes, characteristics of saliva, and ability to swallow. Having a dentist perform all necessary dental work before starting treatment is recommended. Teach the patient to self-examine the oral cavity and how to perform oral care. Oral care should be done at least before and after each meal, at bedtime, and as needed through the day. A saline solution of one teaspoon of salt in one liter of water is an effective cleansing agent. One teaspoon of sodium bicarbonate may be added to the oral care solution to decrease odor, ease pain, and dissolve mucin. Have the patient use a soft, bristled toothbrush. Mucositis or pain in the throat can be eased by systemic and or topical analgesics and antibiotics if infection is present. Monitor and get prompt treatment for oral candidiasis, which often occurs with mucositis. Frequent cleansing with saline and water and topical application of anesthetic gels directly to the lesions are standard care. Anorexia. Anorexia, loss of appetite, is a common occurrence in patients with cancer. It is a side effect of the cancer as well as of cancer treatment. Anorexia may be related to an inflamed mouth or esophagus, which creates difficulty chewing or swallowing, or to emotions such as anxiety or depression. It is important to have a dietitian involved in patient care before cancer treatment starts. Patients with nausea and vomiting, bowel problems, mucositis, and taste changes typically have little desire to eat. Anorexia seems to peak at about four weeks of treatment. It resolves more quickly than fatigue when treatment ends. Monitor patients with anorexia during and after treatment to ensure that weight loss does not become excessive. Observe for dehydration. Small frequent meals of high-protein, high-calorie foods are better tolerated than large meals. Nutritional supplements can be helpful too. Enteral or parenteral nutrition may be needed if the patient is severely malnourished if symptoms are expected to interfere with nutrition for a time, or if the bowel is being rested. Monitor for and manage other symptoms that may interfere with appetite, e.g. nausea, vomiting, pain, depression. Skin reactions. Radiation skin changes. With radiation therapy, skin effects are local, occurring only in the treatment field. Radiation-induced skin changes can be acute or chronic, depending on the area irradiated, dosage, and technique. 
The skin sparing ability of modern radiation equipment limits the severity of these reactions. Erythema may develop 1 to 24 hours after a single treatment. It generally occurs progressively as the treatment dose accumulates. It is an acute response followed by dry desquamation, figure 15.4. If the rate of cell sloughing is faster than the ability of the new epidermal cells to replace dead cells, a wet desquamation occurs with exposure of the dermis and weeping of serous fluid, figure 15.15. .15. Skin reactions are especially evident in areas of skin folds or where skin is subjected to pressure. This includes behind the ear, in gluteal folds, or the perineum, breast, or collar line, and bony prominences. Although skin care protocols vary, basic skin care principles apply. The goal is to prevent infection and promote wound healing. Protect radiated skin from temperature extremes. Do not use heating pads, ice packs, and hot water bottles in the treatment field. Avoid constricting garments, rubbing harsh chemicals and deodorants, since they may traumatize the skin. Dry reactions are uncomfortable and result in pruritus. Lubricate dry skin with a non-irritating lotion, emollient, that contains no metal, alcohol, perfume, or additives. These can be irritating. Calendula ointment and topical hyaluronic acid cream are effective for managing radiation dermatitis. Aloe vera gel is useful for preventing skin problems. Wet desquamation of tissues generally causes pain, drainage, and increased risk for infection. Skin care to manage moist desquamation includes keeping tissues clean with normal saline compresses or modified Burroughs solution soaks. Protect the skin from further damage with moisture, vapor, permeable dressings, or Vaseline petroleum gauze. Because protocols vary widely, you should verify the guidelines in Table 15.12 with your agency's Radiation Oncology Department. Chemotherapy Skin Changes Chemotherapy causes a wide range of skin toxicities. These can range from mild erythema and hyperpigmentation to more distressing effects such as acral erythema and erythrodiesthesia syndrome, also called palmar plantar erythrodiesthesia, or hand-foot syndrome. Erythrodiesthesia syndrome can cause mild symptoms of redness and tingling of the palms of the hands and soles of the feet. It may also cause severe symptoms of painful moist desquamation, ulceration, blistering, and pain. Alopecia is an easily recognizable effect of cancer treatment. Hair loss associated with radiation is local. Chemotherapy affects hair throughout the body. The degree and duration of hair loss depends on the type and dose of chemotherapy agent. Scalp cooling during chemotherapy may reduce alopecia. Cold caps are placed on the head before, during, and after chemotherapy treatment. Common side effects are headache and cold sensation. Alopecia, caused by chemotherapy agents, is usually reversible. Usually, the hair does not grow back until three to four weeks after the end of therapy. Often, the new hair is a different color and texture than the hair that was lost. Patients have a range of emotions at the prospect of losing their hair and when hair loss occurs. These may include anger, grief, embarrassment, or fear. Hair loss is a visible reminder of their cancer and the challenges of treatment. For some people, the hair loss is one of the most stressful events experienced during treatment. The ACS's Look Good, Feel Better program is an excellent support and resource for for people with hair loss and body image changes. Pulmonary effects. Both chemotherapy and radiation have the potential to cause irreversible and progressive lung damage. Distinguishing between the complications of treatment and those related to disease is challenging. The effects of radiation on the lung include both acute and late reactions. Acute effects can be alarming to patients because they may mimic symptoms, e.g. cough dyspnea, that precipitated the cancer diagnosis. Pneumonitis is a delayed acute inflammatory reaction that may occur within one to three months after completing thoracic radiation. This reaction is often asymptomatic, although an increase in cough, fever, and night sweats may occur. Some patients may develop pulmonary fibrosis with or without prior pneumonitis, which is a late effect of therapy. The most common toxicities associated with chemotherapy include pulmonary edema, non-cardiogenic, 
related to capillary leak syndrome or fluid retention, hypersensitivity, pneumonitis, interstitial fibrosis, and pneumonitis due to an inflammatory reaction or destruction of alveolar capillary endothelium. Cardiovascular effects. Radiation to the thorax can damage the pericardium, myocardium, valves, and coronary blood vessels. The pericardium is most often involved. Pericardial effusion and pericarditis are key problems. Patients with pre-existing coronary artery disease are especially at risk. Anthracyclines, e.g. doxorubicin, donorubicin, cause cardiotoxicity. Acute cardiotoxicities may cause electrocardiographic ECG changes. Late effects cause left ventricular dysfunction and heart failure. Baseline and periodic echocardiograms to monitor left ventricular function during treatment are usually done. Cognitive effects. Cognitive effects can happen at any time during cancer, especially after treatment. This change in mental function, often described by patients as mental cloudiness or fog, is commonly called chemobrain. Patients can have thinking and memory problems. Although the brain will usually recover over time, the effects can last a short time or for years. The effects can be so severe that patients may be unable to be involved in any activities that need mental effort, including school, work, or social activities. Reproductive effects. Reproductive problems from radiation and chemotherapy vary according to the radiation treatment field and dosage. The chemotherapy agent and dosage and host factors, e.g. age. Treatment can cause temporary or permanent gonadal failure. Reproductive problems occur most often when reproductive organs are included in the radiation treatment field and when alkylating agents are used. The testes are highly sensitive to radiation. They should be protected with a testicular shield whenever possible. Pre-treatment status may be a significant factor. A low sperm count and loss of motility are seen in those with testicular cancer and Hodgkin's lymphoma before any therapy has begun. Combined modality treatment or prior chemotherapy with alkylating agents enhances and prolongs the effect of radiation on the testes. When radiation is used alone with conventional doses and appropriate shielding, testicular recovery often occurs. Men may have erectile dysfunction after pelvic radiation. The radiation dose that induces ovarian failure changes with age. Unlike the testes, there is no way to repair ovarian function. When radiation therapy is given, the ovaries are shielded whenever possible. Other factors that influence reproductive or sexual functioning in women include reactions in the cervix and endometrium. These tissues withstand a high radiation dose with minimal sequelae. This accounts for the ability to treat endometrial and cervical cancers with high external and brachytherapy doses. Acute reactions such as tenderness, irritation, and loss of lubrication Compromise sexual activity. Late effects of combined internal and external radiation therapy include vaginal shortening related to fibrosis and loss of elasticity and lubrication. The patient and partner need information about the expected effects of treatment related to reproductive and sexual issues. Fertility preservation should be addressed before starting cancer treatment. Pretreatment harvesting of sperm, ova, or ovarian tissue may be considered. Potential infertility can be a significant consequence, and counseling may be needed. However, in no case should the patient think that conception is not possible during treatment. Specific suggestions that have an impact on sexual function include using a water-soluble vaginal lubricant and a vaginal dilator after pelvic irradiation. Encourage discussion of issues related to reproduction and sexuality, offer specific suggestions, and make referrals for ongoing counseling when needed. Late effects of radiation and chemotherapy. Cancer survivors are achieving long-term remission and survival with advancements in treatment modalities. However, therapy, especially radiation therapy and chemotherapy, may cause long-term effects, late effects, that occur months to years after therapy. Every body system can be affected to some extent by radiation therapy or chemotherapy. Acute radiation effects generally manifest as transient inflammatory changes in highly proliferative cells, e.g. epithelial tissues. 
In contrast, late radiation effects occur most often in post-mitotic cells, e.g. liver, kidney, lung, heart, muscle, bone connective tissues. Once they occur, the late effects may be progressive and generally are permanent. Examples range from skin talangiectasias to strictures, fistulas, or radiation necrosis. And I define talangiectasias here. So that is a dilated small blood vessel on the skin or mucous membrane anywhere in the body. It just looks like red squiggly thin lines on the skin surface. Alteration of the lymphatic channels, e.g. axillary lymph node dissection, may contribute to lymphedema. Long-term effects of chemotherapy include cardiac toxicity, cataracts, arthralgia, endocrine problems, renal insufficiency, hepatitis, osteoporosis, neurocognitive problems, or other effects depending on the agents. Arthralgia is simply joint pain. The additive effects of multi-agent chemotherapy before, during, or after a course of radiation therapy can significantly increase the resulting late effects. The cancer survivor may be at risk for secondary cancers, including leukemia, angiosarcoma, and skin cancer. I'm going to define angiosarcoma here. It's a rare cancer that develops in the inner lining of blood vessels and lymph vessels. This cancer can occur anywhere in the body, but most often is in the skin, breast, liver, and spleen. Patients treated with alkylating agents and those treated with high-dose radiation have an increased risk. The potential risk for developing a secondary cancer does not contraindicate the use of cancer treatment. Immunotherapy and targeted therapy. Immunotherapy uses the immune system, the body's main defense against infection and disease, to fight cancer. Some types of immunotherapy are called biologic therapy. Immunotherapy can, one, boost or manipulate the immune system and create an environment that is not conducive for cancer cells to grow, or two, attack cancer cells directly. Types of immunotherapy include cytokines, vaccines, and monoclonal antibodies, Table 15.13. Antibodies are proteins made by the immune system that bind to target antigen on the cell surface. Monoclonal antibodies, drugs ending in MAB, are the most successful immunotherapy because each antibody is specific to an antigen. That mechanism is used to develop specific drugs to treat cancer. Many of the monoclonal antibodies are targeted therapies. Targeted therapy interferes with cancer growth by targeting specific cell receptors and pathways that are important in tumor growth. Targeted therapies work at sites that are on the cell surface at the intracellular level or in the extracellular domain. Figure 15.16 and Table 15.13. Targeted therapies are more selective for specific molecular targets than chemotherapy drugs. Thus, they act on specific targets that are associated with cancer. A major advantage of targeted therapy is that it does less damage to normal cells. As we identify more oncogene targets, agents are being developed that target those specific oncogenes. Targeted therapies provide personalized treatment based on the biology of the tumor. Examples of some targeted therapies are discussed in the next few paragraphs. A major class of targeted therapy is tyrosine kinase inhibitors, table 15.13. Tyrosine kinases are enzymes responsible for activating many proteins by signal transduction cascades. EGFR is a transmembrane molecule that works by activating intracellular tyrosine kinase, TK. Overexpression of G EGFR is associated with unregulated cell growth and a poor prognosis. Drugs that inhibit EGFR suppress cell proliferation and promote apoptosis, programmed cell death.